encourage you tonight is going to be a playoff of what we talked about a little bit last week if you guys weren't here last week if you guys haven't had a chance to check out my youtube channel we have been going through a series called wanting wisdom a 30-day journey that you and i are going through together seeking not just knowledge but applying it to our lives as wisdom if you haven't already i want to encourage you to check out my youtube channel i've been uploading videos every day where we just read a chapter every day a short chapter, and I do my best just to encourage you, help you understand it a little bit so you can take that knowledge and apply it into your life. But when I start bringing up knowledge, the first thing your question is, Susie, where are you? <laughs> Obviously, you can tell, guys, I am not at my house. My wife went away for a week. She is helping lead a summer camp of almost 400 students in New Hampshire. So I decided that since my wife was going to go away anyway, that I was going to go visit my parents. I do not live in the same state as my family anymore. Me and my wife, we got married and did the typical thing and moved away. And so I never get to see my family. So I'm spending the week with them. And yes, you guys can see even some of the pictures. Yes, there is little Susie right there. Yes, laugh all you want. I had some struggle in my early years. Okay, friends, don't you judge me. All right. <laughs> But yes, I'm visiting my family and it has been a great week. We've been trying to get everything uh, put together, but also trying to get some time with my family and it has been absolutely awesome. But guys, this journey through wanting wisdom has really not only got me thinking about really just wanting wisdom and as a young man and as a young church as a whole, really asking God, how can we not just have knowledge, but have wisdom? How can we not just simply have information, but really allow God to bring transformation? And I really started thinking through this concept of really being changed by what the Bible teaches us, by the instruction that God gives you and I, and what are some areas that really as a church, we need to not just be people that are learning stuff, right? These messages are never meant to just be information, but they're meant to be something taught from God's word that as gamers, we can take into our lives and we can walk away and be different. We never want to continue to remain the same. So guys, what I want to do tonight is I want to bring to you a very, very simple concept. I'm going to read one verse. I'm going to bring a big idea, and I'm going to bring a story to you of Jesus that's really going to help us understand as gamers how this big idea can be played out in our life. Because I started thinking through this one concept of Christianity, which in its concept is simple, but in execution is quite difficult. And it's this concept of loving people. As we've been talking to the past few days about this Wanting Wisdom series, that we're not supposed to just take information, but allow it to be transformation. I started thinking about loving people. How often in the church do we hear this? Oh, well, the church should love people. Well, gamers should love people. Well, people should just love people. The world would just be a better place if everyone would love people. And it's talked about in church. It's talked about in life so often. But how many times do you actually see this so irrationally, so genuinely, so unconditionally lived out? in the lives of the people that you surround yourself with, and maybe even your own life that you're living out today. I want to read one verse to you. It comes from John 13, 35. It's going to center us around this big idea that I'm going to bring to you in just a second. John 13, 35, and it says this. This is Jesus talking. And he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, pretty much what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that you will be known as a follower of Jesus if you love people. Essentially, what is he was saying? He says that as the church, he says that as a follower of Jesus, I want you to be known for love. I want you to be known. I want the world to be able to say about you, oh yeah, that that you know, that that Mama Higgs, that Pastor Boz, that Ventus 45. Yeah, I don't know too much about them, but I know what they're for. And they are for people. They are for loving one another. Is it true about your life that people would say about you, maybe even, even if they don't know you very well, maybe they only had one conversation about you, uh, uh, with you, but they'd walk away from that conversation going, yeah, I don't know too much about them, but what I do know is that that is one loving person. What are you known for? And I really believe that Jesus is saying to us here that as a church, as followers of Jesus, as God Squad Church, that we should be known for loving people. And the big idea that I want to bring to you tonight, that I want to center our thoughts around for, that as an individual, as a gamer, as a follower of Jesus, do people know you for what you're for, or do they know you for what you're against? I want to read a story to you. In the book of Matthew, happens to be one of my favorite books, and not just because it has my real name, okay? <laughs> 
but because when I first started following Jesus, this is the first book I read and it just, it just changed my life. When I began to really see what Jesus was like and I began to understand how far my life was looking like his, I began to understand that I've got some work to do, but God's going to help me. So I want to read the first few verses to you. That's really going to help you and I break down this concept of, are we people who are known for love or people who are just known for being against sin? I want to read this to you real quick. Matthew chapter nine, starting in verse nine. And it says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, come on, follow me. And then Matthew arose and began to follow Jesus. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Now, when the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the religious teachers back in the day. These would be the kind of people that studied the Bible. And a lot of times these people had a negative connotation because at all times, these, at some times, these people, they, they kind of had the information, right? They knew what the Bible said, but they were still rude. They were still arrogant in their approach. Why? Because again, they had the information, they had the knowledge, but they hadn't allowed it to be transformation. They were people that weren't known for their love. They were known simply for their knowledge. And the Pharisees, when they saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher, why does Jesus sit with these tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, when Jesus heard it, he said, those, those who are well are in no need of a physician. Those people are healthy. They don't need a doctor, but those who are sick. And Jesus said this, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for i came not to call the righteous but the sinners here we see jesus literally just walking down the road with his disciples and they're just doing their thing and he runs into matthew if you guys have been to church for a long time you know that matthew was one of the disciples but at this point in the story they had never met before jesus matthew has not joined jesus crew of 12 people yet if you've never been to church in your life this man matthew was a tax collector and he was sitting at a tax booth essentially he was at work maybe at the end of his shift and what i need you to understand about the culture back then is that tax collectors were they were essentially bad people because tax collectors back then were a little bit crooked and they would tell you that hey taxes are you know they're five cents Imagine if taxes were only five cents. Thank you, Jesus. And taxes are five cents. But what they would do is that they would lie to you because taxes were really only like three cents. And they would take your three cents, they'd give it to the government, and they would take about two cents for themselves. Back then, tax collectors were bad people. And Jesus is just walking up down the street, and he happens to run into a bad person. Now, see, this is someone that you would think that Jesus would be against. This is not someone that you think Jesus would be for. That's why the Pharisees, the religious people were baffled. Why is this guy, Jesus, sitting with someone whose lifestyle is something that Jesus is against? Because this guy was a liar. This guy was a cheater. This guy was a thief. Why in the world is Jesus sitting with someone whose lifestyle that Jesus is against? And can I tell you, in you and I's life, what are you known for? Are you known for someone who just is against sin? Or are you known for someone who is for people? Are you known for someone who is loved by people? Because that's what the verse we read earlier, John 13, 35, I'm gonna read it again. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What are you known for? Are you the kind of Christian that's simply known for hating sin or are you the kind of Christian just like Jesus who's known for loving people? Because can I tell you, there's a huge difference. Even as I'm speaking today, many of you watching the stream right now, especially if you're not a Christian, the reputation that, that you have, the connotation that you have about people like me, people that claim to be followers of Jesus, it's unfortunate that your connotation is probably a negative one. Because my question is, why is it that if God gave the greatest commandment, that the greatest commandment in all of the Bible is for me to love people and for me to love God. Why is it that the greatest commandment that God gave us, which is to love, if that's the case, why is the greatest thing that you and I known for is by hating? Why in the world, how can it be that if the greatest thing that God has called us to do is to love, then the greatest thing that we're known for is to hate? Because there have been many people in our day who have focused their lives too much on letting people know what they're against rather than letting people know what they're for. And we see Jesus coming on the scene here. 
and he is bumping into someone whose lifestyle is essentially what Jesus is against. Can I tell you, although we are four people as a church, of course, there are standards in God's word that we hold strong to. Though we may be gamers, but when it comes to God's word, then we're not playing games. And can I tell you today that, of course, we have strong stances that anything that in our lives that would separate you from God, we're against those things. But more than we are against sin, we are for people. Because God loves people and he's called you and I to take not just the knowledge that's in his word, but to allow it not just to be just information, but to allow it to become transformation. Can I tell you something today, friends, that Jesus was not just against sin. He was for people. And if you're here today and you've been in church for a long time, maybe, you, maybe you're a part of our community. Maybe you're a part of God's Squad Church. Can I say something? Because I love you. If you're the kind of Christian that you can quote verses word for word, if you're the kind of Christian that, man, someone's like, oh, what does the Bible say? And I mean, you've read the Bible so many times that literally you, you, you put your thumb on the page and you can flip right to it without even searching. Like you just, you're right there. You know this thing so well. But if you're the kind of Christian that can do all those things, that knows the information so well, but you're still in your conversations with people, in your arguments and in your, in your defense of faith with other people. If that's you, you're still arrogant you're still disrespectful in your communication to people. Can I tell you something today? You may be informed, but you have not been transformed. Because when you read this word and you allow it to get into your heart, it'll cause you to treat people with respect. It'll cause you to love people. It'll cause you to be the kind of Christian that doesn't just give off the impression of, oh, I'm against this, I'm against that. You begin to treat people in a way that, oh, I may not exactly agree, with your lifestyle. There may be some differences between, between you and I. There may be some things that I am against in your life, but above all else, I am for you because I care about you, because I love you, because I want the best for you. And I tell you that Jesus bumps into this tax collector by the name of Matthew. And just the next verse, so if you put that back up, I mean, we read, we read chapter number nine. It says he passed on from there. He bumps into Matthew. He says, follow me. And then literally immediately in the next verse, it just says, and as Jesus reclined at the table. So obviously there's kind of a fast forward in scenes here. All of a sudden Jesus is walking down the street and now he's sitting in a chair. Like how do we, how do we get there? There's obviously a little bit of a fast forwarding in the chair, but can I tell you, it's not that, it's not even that Jesus was like, Hey, I see this tax center. Hey, you know what? Uh, you know, sinner, bad person. I, 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 want, I want to get to know you. Why don't you, why don't you come over to my house? Can I tell you that there are other versions translations of the Bible that don't just say that Jesus was reclining at his table at the house. Did you know that it actually says that Jesus went to Matthew's house? That Jesus wasn't like, hey, you know what? Let's come over to my buddy's house. Hey, let's go to a public restaurant because, you know, you're you're kind of weird and you're a dirty sinner and I don't, I don't want you in my house and I don't really want to be in your privacy. No, no. Jesus said, hey, I know that you're not exactly living a lifestyle that I approve of. I know that you might be doing some things that I against. I mean, can I come to your house? I mean, I'd really love to come to where you're at. I'd really love to just get to know you. Why? Because more than Jesus was against his tax collecting sinful lifestyle, Jesus was for him. Jesus loved him. And we see Jesus sitting, but this is cool. I, this is why I encourage you guys. You can't just read the Bible, skim through it, go through it quick. You got to study it and understand it. Because look what it says. And Jesus reclined, that, that word's key. He reclined at the table in the house and behold, now many more tax collectors are sitting around him. So now not only Jesus, he's not just so loving that Matthew's like, yeah, come to my house. He's so loving that other sinners wanna be around Jesus. Do sinners wanna be around you? Are you so full of love that sinners wanna surround themselves with you? Or are you just an obnoxious Christian who all they disclaim is the things that they're against? That all you talk about is, oh, I hate this. I don't associate with these kind of people. I don't talk to these kind of people. Or are sinners anxious to sit at your table? Are you so full of love that sinners, they want to be around you? They might say things like, man, you know what? I don't really believe stuff, but man, I love you, man. I'd love to just hang out with you. I love you, your kindness, your compassion, your mercy. I want to be around you. And Jesus is reclining at the table. And the sinners, look at this. And the sinners came and they start reclining with Jesus. What I want you to get here, friends, is that reclining today was a little bit was a little bit different than it was back then. In the culture and in the time of Jesus, when Jesus walked on this earth, now note, I didn't say when Jesus was alive, because I tell you, Jesus is still alive today, changing lives, changing my life, changing your life. But when Jesus walked on this earth, during that time, during that culture, this symbolic view of kind of 
chilling back, reclining a little bit. It was an, it was a sense of comfort and a sense of desire and a sense of relationship that man, these are my people. I mean, th these are the people that I surround myself with because back then they had this idea of what was, what was pretty much called table fellowship, table time, where you sat at a table with people, those people that you sat with, it was an acknowledgement of the kind of person that you were because you only sat at the people that you would allow yourself to be around. In other words, the people that sat at your table were the kind of people that you associated yourself with and the people that you didn't sit with were the people that you never would have associated yourself with. So these Pharisees, they come on the scene and they're like, why in the world is Jesus associating himself with these sinners? You see, but Jesus is, he's reclining, he's chilling back. But man, these are my people, man. I, I'm just doing my thing. I'm chilling, man. These are my people. These are the people that I love. But not only that, not only is Jesus at a sense of ease, Jesus is at a sense of comfort around these sinners. Now he's causing these other sinners to recline, which means he is so loving and so compassionate, such an awesome guy that these sinners, that they're not uptight around him, that they also are feeling a sense of relaxation. They're also sensing a, a sense of comfort. Why? Because they're understanding that although they might be sitting in the presence of the one who is more against sin than you and I could ever be, they were also sitting in the presence of someone who loved them more than you and I ever could. G they were in the presence of Jesus, who was someone who was so for against people that he was able to sit down with people whose lifestyle were something he was completely against. Why? Because more than Jesus was against sin, he was for people. And I want to ask you today, in your life and in the way that you treat people, when people walk away from a maybe even a first time conversation with you, because I tell you, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So when you're online discussions on Discord with people, in your online voice party chats, maybe when you're praying, uh, play, uh, playing Overwatch or other games, when people walk away from a conversation, do they walk away with an overwhelming sense of, oh, I know what this person is against? Or do they say, man, I really know what this person is for because I can tell that they love people. Can I tell you that they love to be around people? Can I tell you, here's my question I want to ask you. When people walk away from a conversation with you, who people who know you, whether it's people in real life, maybe it's people in our Discord. When people walk away from a first-time conversation with you, do they walk away feeling insulted by what you're against or feeling inspired by what you're for? Do people leave a conversation with you feeling insulted by what you're against or inspired by what you're for? Do people walk away saying, hey, we maybe didn't agree on something, but I know that that guy cared for me. I know that that guy loved me. That God Squad Church is a place where people show an irrational amount of love towards others. People who are different. People who are tax collectors. People who do not follow the Bible the way that we do. But we have a place of so much love that trolls on the internet, they come into our Discord and they're able to recline at the table. They're not sitting up tight. They're not feeling anxious. Am I being judged or are these people actually going to want me here or, or like, am I welcome? No, no, no. I want God Squad Church to be a place where the moment people come into our stream, where the moment people come into our discord, they feel at ease. They feel at ease, not because we're not against some of the decisions they may be making, but because more than we might be against their sin, we are for them as an individual. Because more than we are against problems, we are for people. And I want to ask you, in your life, what impression do you give to other people? Do you give off the impression that, oh, this guy just wants to make sure that I know that smoking pot is a sin? That this guy just wants to make sure that I know that this, 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 and this is bad? Or do they know that you are an oversensing person who wants to make sure that they know that they are loved? Can I tell you, I am in no way saying that our church does not take a stance against sin. Can I tell you, sin is against the holiness of God that it will separate you from God, not only now, but in eternity. And sin is not a joke. It's not something we played with. But can I tell you, more than our church hates sin, we love people. And I want our church to be the kind of place where people can come and, and obviously, metaphorically speaking, can recline at the table. Be, be at a place where they can be at comfort, be at ease, because we're not always trying to attack them and making sure that they're aware of what we're against. The things that we, hey, hey, man, we don't, hey, we don't say those things here, man. Hey, we don't act like that here at God Squad Church. But haven't you got the memo? Haven't you read the rules tab? What's wrong with you? More than we want people to know what we're against, we want them to know what we're for. 
can I encourage you? There've been some times where friends, and I say this because I love you as your pastor, that I'll go through the discord and I'll read some of the messages. And all I see is an overwhelming sense of what we're against. I see these conversations that are being had and it's just a bunch of us as the church making sure that people know, Hey man, we don't do that around here. Hey man, we don't talk that way. Haven't you heard that this is what our community is like? Can I tell you, if you're the kind of Christian that only makes sure that people know what you're against rather than what you're for, then you've allowed this word to simply be information. You know what we should be like, but you don't do it. Can I tell you that this word is alive. It's active. And God wants you and I not to allow it to be information, but to be transformation. In the, pe- in the way you treat people, do people know what you're for or do they only know what you're against? It breaks my heart when I hear these stories of people who, when they first find out that I'm a pastor, when they first find out that we're a gamer church, they want nothing to do with us. Why? Because they think that we're just people who will be against them rather than people who will be for them. In the end of the verse, Jesus goes on to tell these Pharisees, tell these guys who they got all the information. They know the word. They've memorized so much of it. They know the Torah, which was the Old Testament back then, because back then in the life of Jesus, the New Testament was not penned yet because it it had barely even started yet. So they have the Old Testament. These guys do the Old Testament like the back of their hand, but they're still asking Jesus, why are you sitting with these people? And Jesus says to them, man, I didn't come. (laughs) I didn't come for healthy people. I didn't come for people who had it all together. Man, I came for the broken. Man, I came, I came for the lost. I came because I was for people who were far from me. Jesus came to this earth because he was for people who were against him. That's the love that Jesus has for the world. And he says to them, go and learn what this means. Now, this is so beautiful. You got to understand this because he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the people who, quote unquote, know it all. They know this word in the back of their, I mean, they've been studying it their whole lives. They, They don't have much else to learn. They know it all. And Jesus deliberately says to them, go and learn what this means. Because clearly you've got the information. I have the transformation. I want you to go. I don't want you to just go memorize the verse. I want you to go learn it. I want you to go embrace it. And he says this. This is He's quoting something from Hosea, which is an earlier book in the Bible, which means that this is something that they should know because it's in the Bible. It's in the Torah. He says, go and learn what this says. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. See, back in the day, in the old, old cultures of the Bible, God still then, and he does now, desired for us to love him. This commandment of us loving people and loving God, loving one another, being people who are known for love, has been a principle that God's been teaching for thousands of years. And he wants us to be people of mercy, people of compassion, people who love God. And it says here, I desire mercy rather than, than sacrifice. Sacrifices back then would have been anything. Could have been something literally that was called sacrifices, that when we sinned, we'd have to do something, uh, slay some kind of animal to attain forgiveness of our sins. Thank Jesus that he didn't, he didn't, uh, he, that he changed that rule, man. I ain't about to be slaying animals live on stream. That'd be, I'd probably get banned or something, right? That'd be so weird. But Jesus came and changed the rules, but he says, more than your sacrifice, which wasn't just that act of the, the sacrifice of the animal, but the act of just obeying the rules, obeying the law. Well, God, I sacrificed my Friday nights. I don't go out party anymore because I want to follow you because I want to be a Christian. This idea of sacrifice, this idea of obeying the law, obeying the rules. Jesus says, more than I want you to be a follower, I want you to be a Jesus follower. More than I want you to just hate sin, I want you to love me. I want you to love people. Why? Because out of that love will come that hatred for sin. If you truly love God, you won't want to break. If you truly love people, you won't want to disrespect them. If you truly love people, you will want to help them. And Jesus says, more than I want mercy, I don't want sacrifice. More than I want sacrifice, I want mercy. I want love. More than I want you to be someone who's so focused on following rules, which is so outrageously important. I want you to understand that the greatest commandment that Jesus ever gave wasn't make sure you hate sin. The greatest commandment that Jesus ever gave was not make sure you follow the rules. Is that important? Is it crucial to our display of affection towards God? 100%. 
But the greatest commandment that God ever gave was not hate sin. It was love people. And I want to ask you, do people know you as something that you're for or something that you're against? When people walk away from a conversation with you, do they know you as just that Bible thumper? That's just laying down all the rules, man. But did you know the Bible says this? But did you know the Bible says this? Or do they walk away with, man, you know what? I, I don't necessarily believe in the God that he believes in, but I believe that this guy is a guy of compassion, that this guy is a guy of kindness, and this guy is a guy of mercy. Have you truly allowed your life not to just be filled with information, but to be filled with transformation? When it comes to the way that you treat people, do people walk away from a conversation with you, whether it's in discord, in a person, I'll say it again, do they walk away feeling insulted by what you're against or inspired by what you're for? Can you imagine a place called God Squad Church on the internet, a place that at times can be toxic, a place that at times can be dark, and a place, a place at times that can be a place where everyone's against each other, man. Can you imagine thousands of people saying, hey, man, I don't know if I really believe in God, but have you heard of God's church? Because that's like the kindest, nicest, compassionate place I've ever heard of in my life. Like I went there once and they started spamming the chat telling me how, how glad I was, I was here, man. Man, I mean, my name is like inappropriate itself. And no one even mentioned that I had an inappropriate name. No one even mentioned that I had a sinful name. All they mentioned was, hey, bad name. I'm glad you're here. Can you imagine a place where trolls can come in with such an inappropriate name? And before we ever even mention that the name's improper, before we even mention that we're against their name, we mention that we're for them. We mention that we love them. We mention that we're for them. Can you imagine a place where our church gets the reputation of when no matter who comes in, I'm talking about Muslims, atheists, homosexuals, that no matter who comes in our church, that we welcome them, that we love them. And we take them on a process of learning to love God because through loving God, we then learn to hate sin. But can I tell you, learning to hate sin will not cause you to love God, but learning to love God will cause you to hate sin. Is our church going to be a place where people know what we are for, or will it just be a place where people know what we're against? I want to encourage you in your life, in the way you treat people, in the way you talk to people. Are you the kind of Christian that knows just like the Pharisees? They know, they know what it says. I mean, I got the verses. I can quote it for you. I can read this whole thing to you. Are you the kind of Christian, just like the Pharisees, who knows the word, but Jesus would say to you, hey, man, go and learn it, because clearly you have not. Go and learn this principle. Go and learn this commandment. It's not a suggestion. Go and learn this commandment that God has called you and I to love people. Do people walk away from a conversation with you feeling insulted by what you're against or inspired by what you're for? Because I tell you, Jesus came to this earth because he loved people. Jesus died on the cross because he loved people, not because he hated sin. I want to tell you today, I need you to understand this right here, that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He died on the cross because he loved you. Can I tell you that if you and I had just rejected God, which a lot of us did, if you and I had just rejected God for all of eternity and that Jesus never came to this earth, and never died for the cross, which means that you and I would never be able to go to heaven. If Jesus just let all that happen, you realize that Jesus would still just keep on being Jesus, right? You realize that apart from my submission to him, it doesn't make God any less God. Before Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die on the cross because sin was altering his authority. He didn't die on the cross because sin was making him look bad. Jesus didn't die on the cross because he hated sin and he wanted to get rid of it once and for all. No, no, no. Jesus died on the cross because he loved you and he wanted you for himself. He wanted to bring you back to himself. He wanted to redeem you back to himself. Can I tell you, if Jesus never died on the cross, he'd still be good and he'd still be God. Sin did not alter him. God is God without me. God is God without you. He's still perfectly holy. He still has all power and authority in this universe. And without us and without dying on the cross, Jesus would still be God. And Jesus would still be holy. Jesus didn't die on the cross because he hated sin. He died on the cross because he was for you. And I need you to understand that today, that God in all of his mercy, just like it said, I desire mercy. God in all of his mercy was against sin, yes, but he was against sin, one, because it's against his holiness. It's against his authority. It's against who he is. 
but Jesus is against sin because it separates you from him. And although we were living a lifestyle that was against God, the Bible says that while you and I were far from God, Jesus died for us. While you and I were against God, Jesus was for you. And he gave his life to die for you. Although you and I have been far from God at times, maybe some of you are far from God right now. Maybe you're living a life that is completely against God, that even in your sin, even in your rebellion towards God, can tell you that he is for you, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he died on the cross because he was so unconditionally in love with you that he wanted to bring you back to himself, to give you a new life today. And he wants to teach you not to just be someone who makes sure the world knows that everything they're against, but to be someone who knows what you are for. Because when you are for people, people know that you love them. People know that you care for them. But I need you to know today, friends, if you're here and you've never given your life to follow Jesus, you've got to know that he loves you. You got to know that he cares for you and that he wants to change your life. He wants to take you on a journey of following him. He wants to give you a new life. The Bible says in abundance, life to the fullest. Will your life be perfect? No. Are you going to get a Ferrari tomorrow? No. You're going to get something even better. You're going to get eternal life in heaven. You're going to get peace. You're going to get God's love, God's forgiveness. You're going to stand before God one day and God's going to say, welcome. Well done, my good and faithful, faithful servant. Enjoy eternity for all of eternity. Enjoy heaven for all of eternity. But all that was made possible for me and for you because Jesus was for you, because he loved you, and he's calling you today to be for people. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to follow Jesus, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you never knew that God was for you. All you ever grew up knowing that was God was against your sin and that God was against your lifestyle and therefore God was against you. I'm going to tell you, God may be against your sin. God is against your sin, but he is for you. God loves you. He cares for you. And God wants you just the way you are today. I want to tell you today, this decision was the best decision you ever made in your life. But maybe you're here and you've been a part of God's squad church. And maybe you're here and to be honest, man, I, looking back at the way that I talk in Discord, I don't know if people would label me as someone knowing that what I'm for. Maybe I've given off the impression of just letting people know what I'm against. If you've been the kind of person that maybe you'd kind of say, you know what, I'd really like to be the kind of person that's just known for an irrational, unconditional kind of love. I don't want people to, to know me that what rules I'm against. I don't want people to know me as that Bible thumper that all they do is make sure that everyone know that this, this, and this is bad. If you want to be the kind of Christian, the kind of radical example, just like Jesus, where people who are far from God are able to recline at your, comfort, at your table, to feel at ease, to feel welcomed, to feel loved, to feel non-judged. If you and I are going to claim to be followers of Jesus, if you and I are going to love people, then we've got to be willing. Like it said, they will know, John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you, if you love one another. That means that disciples need to be known for loving people. And can I tell you, if you're only known for hating sin and not known for loving people, have you truly let this word change your heart? I want to be clear here at God Squad Church. We seek holiness. We flee from sin. But more than we hate sin, we love people. And I'll tell you, in your life, do people walk away from a conversation with you feeling insulted by what you're against or inspired by what you're for? Do people walk away feeling loved, feeling encouraged, feeling respected? Even Can I tell you, you can, you can, you can respectfully agree to disagree. We don't have to agree on everything, but we can still love one another. Say in my stream every day, we have people that come in that we do not agree on certain things in life. <laughs> There's no question about that. There are some things that me and my chat, we do not. Why? Because I have standards that I follow from God's word. I'm going to tell you that even if we disagree, we can still love one another. We can still be for each other. I want to be the kind of person that people know what I'm for rather than what I'm against. Because Jesus has called you to be a person of love rather than a person of hate. Are you the kind of person that people know what you're for, what you're for, what you're against? I see you guys in the chat, man. Like I said, not just letting the word just be information, but allowing it to be transformation.
Because if we really are going to be followers of Jesus and understand that his greatest, Jesus said it himself, the greatest commandment I give to you is to love God and love people. And if the greatest thing that God has called us to do is to love, then it should be the greatest thing that you and I are known for.